Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. I'm Diane Mueller, and I'm really thrilled to have with me today Tal Leron from um, the Telco Solutions and Enablement Group at Red Hat, um, part of the, the office of the CTO, coming to talk to us about um, Kubernetes operators for Telco workloads, which um, basically covers every buzzword bingo of every conversation I've had probably for the past le week with the Telco teams and the operators team, and everybody does love um, a bit of Kubernetes. So um, I'm really thrilled. Uh, Tal has really thought a lot about um, the pattern of Kubernetes operators and wrote an incredible internal white paper, which he's turned into an external one that we'll give you a link to at the end of this. Um, and I think he really kind of expressed the role of operators um, and and really explained the greatness of um, using this pattern. So I'm going to be quiet and let Tal um, walk through his, um, his his thinking around this topic. And you can ask questions in the chat. We'll leave some time at the end, um, wherever you are, um, on in, whether you're watching on YouTube or Blue Jeans or uh, in Twitch. Um, you can ask um, questions, and we'll relay them back to um, Tal at the end. If we don't get to all of your questions, we will um, post it in the blog and try and answer them in a blog after this. So with that um, intro, Tal, um, thank you very much for today um, and taking the time. Um, Tal, tell us about yourself and take it away. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I think you covered everything. I'm an engineer in uh, the Telco Solutions and Enablement team at uh, Red Hat. We're part of ecosystem engineering. Um, I've been working <laughs> with with telco workloads on kubernetes for a very long time and and operators is always the uh the topic that comes up so correct there's a lot of buzzwords here but hopefully after this presentation you'll uh you'll realize that there, there's some uh, substance behind it um so i will dive right in because i have quite a lot to cover um this presentation will be divided into four parts uh where the first part will be Kind of a history and context to get people on board to understand what are we even talking about here why why is this important why are telcos using kubernetes operators and why are they even interested in that then we're going to move to talking about what operators really are then we're going to go back to telco and look at actual use cases where uh, kubernetes operators can can really help and finally, I'm going to discuss some, some practical considerations. So much of this presentation could be interesting for people who are not working in telco and are just generally interested in what operators can do. So um, we'll, we'll move in and out. So, oops. But here we go. Part one, how did we get here? <laughs> why, why are we talking about uh, telco workloads and Kubernetes operators? I'll give you some prehistory in this graph, uh, in this uh, slide. So um, the issue is network equipment. <laughs> and from, from the very start, uh, uh, telcos have been uh, decoupling things. So this is a history of decoupling to an extent, where you, you had big networks run by a big telecommunications company. Think about a transatlantic uh, telegraph, right, in the 19th century. You have all kinds of equipment along the way, but it's always been decoupled. Uh, that is, we had network equipment providers that made and sold the, comp the, the, uh, the equipment and also serviced it, and then you had the operator. And here, operator in the telecommunications sense, so we, have, we have a little bit of confusion here. But um, these, uh, in this case, when I say operator, I do not mean a Kubernetes operator. So the, the network operator, uh, the telecommunications company, would be working with these uh, other companies that would actually provide the hardware. And it, it was from the start also a very multi-vendor situation where you might have equipment coming from different, different providers, different vendors, and um, they would need to work together, right? You have Telegraph on both sides of the Atlantic. They might be uh, bought by two different companies, but they have to work with each other. So standards were part of the story from the very, very start as well making sure that different companies could uh, make equipment and connect it to other equipment. Um, so uh, the, fir the first real phase uh, uh, of this history starts with computerization, where we started to add, uh, you can call it smart network equipment, and um, 
it started to contain microchips, and in many cases, it, it was actually specialized computers of some kind. Um, we're still at this step, <laughs> to be honest. We, we haven't left it uh, at all. All of these steps in the history are still with us, and we are still using a lot of equipment that is basically a specialized computer. Um, and those are becoming interesting, too, because when you look inside those specialized computers, sometimes they can look a lot like clouds, but I'm, I'm jumping ahead here. Um, you know, this is part of a general evolution from analog to digital, but keep in mind that we still have a lot of analog, right? If you think of something simple as a digital analog converter of a voice to digi digital, right? Um, antennas with radio waves for cellular networks, right? We, we're still dealing with a lot of analog stuff, and computers are still doing analog work here. Uh, but there's definitely, we can see a trend of evolution to make more and more of our, our, our uh, information uh, digital. Um, the second big phase that, again, we're still part of this, uh, this history is um, virtualization. And uh, a colleague recently corrected me, you know, we, we sometimes think of this world, word if we're engineers in terms of things like virtual machines or uh, virtualizing uh, network interfaces like uh, SRIOV. So we have virtualization technologies built into uh, our computers these days that we, and operating systems that we, we definitely use. But virtualization here is meant in a different way. It, the idea here is that virtual is as opposed to physical or actual. The idea being that we're decoupling the, the hardware from the software. Um, so suddenly our equipment, we can talk about it being virtual meaning that it is no longer uh, a, a physical piece of equipment, but it's actually a piece of software that can run on a piece of hardware. Um, and this decoupling basically introduced new kinds of players to, to the game. If it was before we talked about these um, network equipment providers, right, in the prehistory slide, now we can talk about hardware vendors versus software vendors. Um, and we, we're, we're also changing our term, terminology a bit. So we can still talk about equipment, but now we're talking about network functions. And I'm going to dive into that a bit more in a bit. And so we can see here that there, we really have two different kinds of network functions, the physical ones and the virtual network functions, VNFs. And again, I'll emphasize, the virtual here does not mean it's a virtual machine necessarily. It could be, right? But uh, all... Anything that's decoupled from hardware would be a virtual network function, even if it's running in a container, right? Because that's the idea here of virtual. Um, important parts of this story are that we started to evolve to use off-the-shelf products, right? Off-the-shelf hardware and off-the-shelf software. And this story is kind of hard, this, this evolution, because, again, some of this equipment can be very specialized and require very specialized hard hardware. And... Um, but in some cases, especially in software, you know, that, that's easier to, to move around. So the first phase is the one that we're really involved in right now. That's, uh, I'm calling it cloudification. Here we're complicating the picture even more because in, in terms of software, we're talking about uh, um, cloud native network functions. That is network functions designed to run on, on clouds, on cloud platforms. But then we're also introducing uh, uh, the platform vendors uh, who actually create these, these uh, cloud uh, platforms. So more and more players, more and more decoupling. Um, and again, there, there are some trends in the evolution here. So we're still using a lot of virtual machines for sure. But the trend is also to move to containers uh, in many cases and Possibly the most interesting trend for us here in, in this presentation is the move from what I call management to orchestration, uh, moving from something like OpenStack to something like uh, uh, Kubernetes. And here, here it's important. The move from OpenStack to Kubernetes is not just a move from virtual machines to containers. That's actually the least interesting part of it. The real interesting part is that we are uh, no longer providing infrastructure, but rather orchestrating our workloads. Um, that's what Kubernetes really brings to the table. Um, and I'm, I'm very, I'm oversimplifying this quite a lot here. 
there's a lot going on, but um, my, I'm, my point here is just to give you context. And I'm mentioning here we're also using public clouds in some cases, um, and that might sound strange to you. Why would a telecommunication, a network function run on a public cloud? Well, so much of it ends up being looking a lot like enterprise software or IT software even. Think of a, a cellular network where you're connecting a, your cell phone with a SIM and somewhere there is a record of that SIM and who it belongs to and to what account. Um, there's a database where all of this is stored with security keys, et cetera. That's kind of an, a normal IT workload that could potentially uh, uh, run on just truly generic hardware and truly generic clouds. And they could even be public clouds. So, so that's, a, that's the overall context of where we are. And it's, it was important for me to present all this because uh, all of these steps, these three steps are still with us. And that's part of the story of where Kubernetes operators become interesting and useful. Um, okay, now let's switch gears <laughs> and move to really discuss uh, something more abstract. What are these, what are these operators that uh, we're talking about? Um, there's something called the operator pattern, which is, has been with us for a quarter of a century right now. I'll open the link here. This is the oldest uh, version that I at least found on the internet, but I'm sure they're older. Uh, from 1997, the operator design pattern for parallel computation. <laughs> um, and my point here is that it's really used in a computational sense. Uh, and we're, we're not talking about functions, you know, even when we talk about network functions and uh, before, we're, we're talking about something that does continuous work. So don't think of it in terms of arithmetic and also don't think of it in terms of a computer program calling a function. Right, that function is triggered by one thing, and then it ends, right? The function is called, <laughs> eventually it returns. Uh, and operators are kind of the same in that, in that way. But here we're talking about things that do continuous work. The network function is constantly functioning, and the operator is also continuous, uh, uh, continuously doing its work. Um, our context here is really, um, if, when we apply this to uh, a declarative intent-oriented orchestration context, just like Kubernetes, uh, the operator has a special meaning. It consumes intent as its input and emits intent as its output. And the next slide, if, if that's not very clear, the next slide, uh, we'll talk about it a bit more. But again, I'm emphasizing the fact that this is continuous. The operator is continuously monitoring that input, if that input changes, and continuously managing the output uh, to make sure that it, it matches our uh, our intent. Uh, we can see here that we can divide really operators into two kinds. There would be pure operators that have no side effects and that all they do is consume intent and emit intent. But a lot of times we, we're interested in impure operators that do additional work in addition to emitting intent. And let's take a look at some applications of uh, the pure operator pattern in Kubernetes, and hopefully that will clarify what we mean here. Um, so it, um, there, there are many examples of this, but this is probably the, the most uh, uh, accessible to everybody. Think of creating a deployment in Kubernetes. Uh, the deployment uh, descriptor uh, will be managed by the deployment controller, which in this case is an operator. Uh, so the deployment controller will take that deployment and create a replica set. So the intent uh, consumed by this operator would be the deployment and the intent emitted and managed by the operator would be the replica set. Uh, and this is a pure operator, right? Um, the deployment can, um, you know, if we delete the deployment, the replica set will be deleted as well and uh, they're tied together. Uh, the second operator in the chain is also a pure operator and that's the replica set. So now we have the replica set controller <laughs> and the replica set controller takes that replica set descriptor and emits pods, one or more or zero or more pods uh, and, and with their descriptors. And again, it's a pure operator. That's all it does. It, it doesn't have any side effects. That's its entire job. Finally, we reach the pod controller. And in this case, we are not applying the operator pattern uh, or at least not in a, in a strict sense because we are actually terminating the operational graph and moving to the real world. Here we're only interested in the side effects, the actual containers that are going to 
uh, match work with the pods. And the pod controller makes sure to work with the cont container runtime to connect those to each other. Um, so we have a graph, right? We have a graph of two operators reaching, and they're terminated at, at, one, at one side. So one way to look at this graph is that we move from the left side, the more abstract, to the right side being more concrete. Um, I, I encourage everybody to open their imagine, imagination a little bit regarding the operator pattern because it's not, it's not just abstraction to concreteness. You can think of it as a, as a kind of translation as well. We're translating intent between different kinds of domain. And this, again, would become very important in telco workloads where we we're constantly doing work of translation between domains and standards, et cetera. So um, it's not just about getting more concrete. It's, it's about a different kind of intent almost, or, or even translating between paradigms, really. Um, OK, this, <laughs> this next slide, uh, I, I, I'm not going to do the sad trombone sound, but I hope you hear it in your head. Uh, I, I wish I didn't have to include this slide, but uh, unfortunately, the Kubernetes official terminology is very confusing. Um, if we look at the actual links that I provided here, so when we talk about controllers in Kubernetes, these are the built-in controllers, and there's really discussion of the controller pattern, and this is all okay. <laughs> What's not so okay is uh, the discussion of the operator pattern, which um, is simply wrong. <laughs> it, this, for 25 years, we've been using the, um, the operator pattern terminology, but uh, Kubernetes has decided to use that in a different way. So in the Kubernetes terminology, when we talk about controllers, we're talking about the built-in operators. So everything you saw here on the previous slide, all of these are controllers, even though they implement the operator pattern. But when we say operator, in, in the, according to the official terminology, we're talking about a custom controller. So any custom controller that, that you create and add to Kubernetes would be called an operator, um, even if it doesn't implement the operator pattern. So it's, it's, uh, it's confusing, and we, we're just stuck with phrases like we can talk about a Kubernetes controller that implements the operator pattern or a Kubernetes operator that does not implement the operator pattern, unfortunately. But, you know, that terminolog terminological soup is just there, uh, but it doesn't change what we're actually interested in here. And, um, and, and that's the important thought. We, we care about Kubernetes operators, even if they don't apply the operator pattern, whether they're pure operators or impure operators is, uh, could be important to the architecture we're creating, but in the end, they're useful even if they're not applying the operator pattern. So if you, think of, you, want, if you want to think of it as a custom controller, that's one way to think a bit about it. Um, and the question of whether you need the operator pattern has to do with your, your entire architecture and your entire strategy. Are you trying to create a kind of Unix philosophy tool that could be reused? For example, if you go back here, the replica set controller, replica sets are us usable even without deployment controllers, right? They can be used directly and they could be connected maybe from to other operators that would sit before them and, and generate intent. So, um, so yeah, d don't worry too much that you have to apply the operator pattern everywhere in order to make good use of Kubernetes operators. But it's important to know what you're doing, <laughs> which I hope this, this presentation is clarifying. Um, and also another thing you should not do is reinvent wheels. There's, there's a whole bunch of uh, operators out there already of uh, diverse quality and uh, um, diverse abilities, uh, but uh, look at them first. And of course, something off the shelf might not do exactly what you need, and then you, you need to generate your own. So sometimes you do need to uh, retrofit a certain wheel, maybe. Uh, but this is, almost all of these are open source, and um, that's possible to do if you need to do it. Um, okay, well, Swift, well, Swift, <laughs> Sorry, shift gears back to talking about telco and uh, look at how everything we discussed until now could be used for, for telco workloads. Um, the first use case is um, stateful components. And this is, the, the vast majority of operators that are out there in the wild are really uh, uh, dealing with state. 
And, and there's a good reason for this. Uh, Lifecycle management is built into Kubernetes in a very specific way, right? You, you're familiar, you, you create a resource, for example, a pod, and it will create the containers around it. If you delete the pod, those will be deleted. If you update the pod, maybe some change to the containers will happen too. Um, so there is lifecycle management in Kubernetes, but it's, it's, it's very, very specific. Um, unfortunately, many stateful components are, are not, uh, they don't work that way. You know, if you have, a, say, a database cluster, let's say it's a database cluster with 10 uh, instances running, um, they might work together in ways that you, you do not want to sim simply remove, delete one. <laughs> Right, you, you want to maybe, or, or add one. Maybe it needs to be synchronized when it, when it is added in. Uh, there, there are all these issues with state that um, are more complicated than just adding and deleting. And that's when your operator come in, an impure operator, to, to handle all that specialized work that uh, you would need to do. Um, and again, remember, the operator is continuous, so it would be constantly monitoring, say, your database cluster and making sure that, you know, if a node falls off that you, we can create another node and maybe add it in the correct way, et cetera. Um, there is a lot of state and network functions too. So uh, here I'm emphasizing that you might think that networks are, are very stateless things, right? A component along the way is like a router, a gateway. Where's the state there? Well, there's configuration state, but beyond that, there's state that has to do with the we, with the actual network. There are a lot of issues with uh, maintaining connections, sessions, load balancing them. There are aspects that are cross components. You might have multiple network functions that are actually part of the same uh, uh, overall session. Uh, so again, same thing with databases. Think of it that way. You can't just add a node or delete a node whenever uh, it works for you. You have to ensure that you can scale out or heal out or scale down without packet loss and while maintaining these sessions. Because, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's pretty obvious. So again, stateful components are a great reason uh, or a great use case for, for creating operators. Um, configuration management is another very big one. Um, Network functions, I think, more than any kind of uh, workload you might be familiar with, involve very heavy configuration. So much so that a whole set of standards and uh, and uh, uh, stacks of software have been created just to to configure to configure network devices um, and network functions. Um, and they're they're complex enough that you can really imagine a complete workflow of configuration. Uh, so think of it. Think of configuring a router, well, first of all, you need to find out, well, maybe how many interfaces the router has. Uh, so you need to query the router, and according to if it's this kind of router or that kind of router, you might have a different uh, branching workflow here and, and do other kind of work. So um, there's a lot of work with configuration. And again, this is a great use for an operator. An operator can encode a lot of that configuration and because it's running on the cluster, it can do that locally. So for a long time in, in uh, configuration management for, uh, for networks, we had some sort of orchestrator that sits maybe far away from the, the site that manages the configuration from afar. But by moving it to locally to an operator on Kubernetes, we, we are uh, delegating some of that work. I'm gonna talk about that a bit more in, in, uh, in other slides, but... Um, uh, it makes sense to, to keep the code close to the data in this case. Uh, and here I'm linking to an operator that I've been working on that's uh, been doing exactly that. It lets you write these workflows using Python and have them run in your cluster. Um, third use, disaggregation and modularity. Um, and this might seem obvious, but, um, but again, it has a, a very specific bent, I think, in telco. Uh, we can th think of breaking up that big orchestrator that sits far away to a bunch of operators that work locally at the sites. Um, 
and when I when I talk about sites, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of sites <laughs> in some cases. Think about a, uh, a network operator that, and here I'm using the term operator as a, uh, not a Kubernetes operator, but uh, a telco, telecommunications company that uh, covers a continent. Think how many cellular antennas are out there. How many uh, big clusters in, in cities. Um, we're talking about many, many, many sites. So the, the scalability challenge is, is mind boggling almost. Um, so here again, breaking up that big orchestrator to Kubernetes operators that can work locally at the sites means that, uh, first of all, they'll operate faster because they're close to the, to the things that they're operating and they're able to make autonomous decisions. And here there's an entry for using machine learning and artificial intelligence to allow them to make these decisions better. So even if they lose connection to the central big orchestrator, they can still operate autonomously. So a huge advantage for reliability too. Um, and huge advantage, I think, to design. You can create an operator that does one thing well, rather than work on a very big orchestrator, which could be an enormous project. And um, um, yeah, you can separate it off. So, so um, it fits again with our, our history of decoupling. So let's add more decoupling. <laughs> um, we can think of these then as these operators as part of a large orchestration narrative. And um, so they fit in with other things. And again, you know, they accept int intent and they could emit intent. And you can think of it as part of a, a big graph that, uh, that really describes your, your entire orchestration strategy. Um, the fourth use it sounds like the opposite of the first use, <laughs> that the previous use. So, yes, you can you can you can disaggregate, but you can also use operators to actually integrate. And we see a lot of operators like this actually, operators that are installers. So think of creating a custom resource that describes your whole product. We see that a lot with databases, for example. So uh, you'd like to install, say, a MariaDB cluster. Well, the MariaDB operator will install all of those for you. Um, installer is not the best word for those because we're also talking about uh, day two changes. That is, after it's installed, you might be updating it and you'll want to see those changes happen as well, at least if it's, if it's a good operator. <laughs> um, there's, there's some history to this that uh, uh, predates um, uh, Kubernetes and really predates cloudification. Um, the, the terminology here, I'll just go over it briefly. Oh, for a long time, we've been talking about uh, um, uh, s specialized via virtualized network function managers versus generic virtual network function managers. The idea being that uh, uh, an equipment provider can provide the equipment, but also the virtual equipment, and also provides a management suite designed for that equipment. So we would, if we want to manage the equipment, we would work with that uh, management suite. But a lot of us have been hoping that there will be generic versions of that, so we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel every time we're using different kinds of equipment and have something that might be specialized and quirky. So, um, so that kind of manager would be able to be configured or changed or programmed in some way to handle other kinds of CNF. So that's, again, something that I'm, wor I'm working on specifically. Uh, there's a project called Turandot which is a Kubernetes operator that uses Tosca to, to configure what kind of uh, network functions you're working with or gen general workloads. Um, so, so yeah, there, there are two trends here, right? There's one trend here to disaggregate and modularize and use the Unix philosophy. But there's another trend where we can encapsulate all the work inside an operator. And the question is, well, should we use one approach or the other? And I say both. <laughs> I think both of them make sense and it depends on what you're looking at. The, the rule of thumb that I always apply is keep the code close to the data. So if that means that you want to integrate it into an operator, then okay, you're, you're integrating. And if that means the opposite, <laughs> then you're uh, disaggregating and using the operator to modularize. Um, and I think this is, yeah, this is the final use case and then I'll jump into the next topic. Um, why not do all our work in Kubernetes? So if you remember, we still, 
the three phases of history that I started with are still with us today. We still have a physical network functions, and they're not running on the cloud, uh, on any cloud platform. They're running on some sort of specialized uh, uh, hardware. Um, why not manage them from Kubernetes too? So I've, I've come to uh, call these representational operators because they're operators that do work on representations that exist in Kubernetes rather than the resources themselves, right? They're not running in the cluster. Now, why would you do that? Well, you're, you're basically putting all your work in uh, one place. You know, if you're already committed to using Kubernetes for orchestrating your telco workloads, uh, why not use Kubernetes to also orchestrate your uh, PNFs? And, um, it, it makes sense too because the technologies end up being uh, very similar too. If you think of configuration using say the NetConf protocol, well the physical network functions are using it, but the cloud native network functions might be using that as well. And there are examples of the industry of exactly uh, doing that and you know, a, a Kubernetes operator or you can call it a controller if it doesn't, it's not uh, applying the operator pattern uh, that manages a box that sits outside of the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and we can you know, update the, the custom resource for it, et cetera, and uh, it would work, it would seem to work as if it's within the, the cluster, the, uh, within the cluster. Um, so we stay within the same paradigm. Okay, we'll shift gears again now and talk about, um, well, how do we do all this and what should we, we be worried about and uh, what are the pain points <laughs> And uh, this is from doing a lot of work with operators and uh, reporting from the trenches over some of the uh, uh, problems you might encounter. So, um, one, one problem is the uh, custom resource definition implementation in Kubernetes. Sad trom trombone again here because Custom resources are namespaced in Kubernetes, but custom resource definitions are not. They are defined cluster-wide. Uh, it might sound like, okay, that's not a problem. You can just, well, you'll just install them in the cluster. But in, in a lot of uh, uh, management scenarios, uh, you know, not everybody has those privileges. The question then becomes, is the operator part of your workload or part of the platform itself? Um, and there's no easy way around this. I hope that Kubernetes ends up fixing this. I'm, it, it would require a, a major change to, into how it's designed and how custom resource definitions are designed. But I think that would go a very long way to make operators more portable so you can include them as part of workloads and not think that you have to install them separately. But, and another problem with custom resources that I'm mentioning here is that there's a size limit of about one megabyte. So depending on what you're doing, you might hit that size limit. Um, the thing is, don't, don't worry. <laughs> there are uh, very good alternatives actually to using custom resources. Um, you, custom resources are, 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 uh, are uh, a nice tool that comes with Kubernetes, but you don't have to use it if it doesn't work well for you. And uh, putting out as one alternative, you can use config maps. There are also general purpose uh, resources in Kubernetes, and you can use them any way you want. Why not use them to store your... Uh, your custom resources, you know, use them as descriptors and you can add annotations and, and uh, your own uh, validation and schema, et cetera. Uh, you can build that uh, yourself on config maps. Uh, another approach is to use annotations. And here we can talk about fine-grained operators, that is operators that don't work on complete intent, but work on aspects of intent. That's still an application of the operator pattern. And a great example of this is Multis. So uh, Multis would look for annotations on existing resources and those become part of the intent, right? They're not part of the custom resource, but they're actually an additions to existing resources. So um, uh, yeah, that's a great strategy too. You don't have to start with CRDs. So again, I'm going back to that uh, page, the operator design parent pattern uh, from uh, the official Kubernetes uh, documentation. And um, yeah, again, it's talks, it talks a lot about custom resources, but no, you don't have to use custom resources if, if, that, if they're hard to use or if they um, don't do what you need to do. Um, 
Or, you know, another alternative is you can actually store your intent elsewhere. And sometimes it's already stored elsewhere if you have some sort of orchestration system that you're working with or a database. You could use your the custom resource or a config map or an annotation to just point to that. So work with IDs instead of actually storing everything there. And that, of course, solves the problem of the one megabyte uh, uh, limit to each of these. So if you store it in your own database, do what you need. And yeah, GitOps, right? Um, why not store it in a Git repository too? That's another approach that you can take. So your custom resources will be the live uh, pointers to uh, intent stored in a Git repository. And your operator, again, remember it's continuous. It would, it would have to monitor it and look at uh, changes to Git. And you can do that through triggers uh, for commits and, and uh, react accordingly. Um, another practical consideration. Um, and it, it a little bit relates to the previous one. Should the, the operator be installed in the na namespace in which it's going to work, or should it be general and work with all namespaces? And for different kinds of operators, it could make sense to have one versus the other. Um, and many operators actually support both configurations. So if you want, you can install it within a specific namespace or separately. And again, this goes back to the issue of, well, if I'm packaging a network function with its dependencies, its operators, or do I say, well, are these dependencies something that the platform has to provide for, for the workload to run? So this is a question that um, needs to be solved as part of the overall uh, deployment strategy. But, but technically, it's rather simple. It's, it's usually not hard to create an operator that can support both of these. The, the Kubernetes API server uh, always requires a namespace anyway when it works. So my advice is why not do both if you can? <laughs> Make it a, a flag when the operator runs to say whether it's running in namespaced or clustered mode. The difference, of course, if it needs to be work in cluster-wide mode, you do need cluster-wide permissions to install it. And of course, if it uses the custom resource definition, it does require those uh, cluster-wide privileges. Um, another practical consideration is garbage collection. Um, uh, Kubernetes has uh, garbage collection. <laughs> it's nice. It's very useful for the operator pattern because the idea is that you can make the emitted intent uh, owned by the consumed intent. So if you delete the input, the output will be deleted too. Um, and that works, uh, you know, if you delete a deployment in Kubernetes, the replica set will be deleted. The, when the replica set gets deleted, the pods get deleted, and eventually the containers would be destroyed. So uh, this kind of built-in garbage collection could be great. It could really uh, add robustness, right? If, even if your operator crashes, <laughs> uh, Kubernetes can make sure to delete the outputted intent. Um, it's not good for stateful components, though, for the, all the reasons we stated before, where you know, there's a specialized lifecycle management. So we don't just want, say, the database to be deleted. The node, maybe it needs to, we need to update a connection URL. Maybe we need to make sure that the data in the node has been synchronized before we delete it. So again, an operator can come in here and, and implement its own garbage collection. So just something to, to be aware of. Uh, decide for yourself whether you want to use the built-in garbage collection or not. Um, and finally, <laughs> um, the, the big practical consideration really is developing these in the first place. I, it's not trivial. <laughs> Kubernetes is a very uh, asynchronous environment. Um, Kubernetes is written in Go, but I do want to emphasize that you do not have to write your operator in Go too, even though it's the native language uh, of Kubernetes. Um, but whatever you do, it's not going to be trivial. Jumping into developing operators uh, uh, requires a learning curve and a, and a commitment uh, to uh, uh, working within this, this complex ecosystem. Um, I listed here a whole bunch of licks that, that people can take a look at to see, either get inspiration or get a head start. Uh, some of these can be used maybe for prototyping an operator before you're actually going to maybe develop it fully. Um, and uh, there, there's no easy way out of this. I'm, I'm hoping that making operators will become easier and easier. Um, Ansible operators, for example, are very easy. Um, if you know how to write an Ansible playbook, you can package it inside an app operator. That's a great way to start. 
Um, but of course, if you have to work with network devices and things that don't have the Ansible support, then you have to do it anyway. And then you, if you have to encode the, the lifecycle management logic too, well, well, there you go. So, so it's a good idea to look first at what's available off the shelf that could help you uh, before you jump into uh, developing a full-blown operator on your own. Um, and with that, I'm kind of glad that I managed to fit it in because I did want to <laughs> leave room for questions. Um, I will notice here, as Zayan said, uh, this presentation is based on a much longer document that I've created in the context of the, uh, the CNCF, uh, uh, CNF working group. So we have a working group there that we are trying to develop best practices for developing uh, cloud native network functions. And uh, from the discussions we had there, I created this very long document, which this presentation was uh, a boil down version of. And uh, it is a public document, so uh, anybody can comment on. And uh, just make sure that you remember that when you comment on it, that uh, this is uh, public <laughs> and will be seen, could be seen by anybody. And with that, I am done with my main presentation and happy to have questions, comments, and discussions. Well, as, as always, Tal, um, it is, um, a tour de force uh, on the topic, and it makes it stretches the um, the definitions that we're used to and maybe comfortable with around operators. And really, thank you for this because I think um, I'll, I'll post the link in a minute into the chat with um, the full document link. But um, I, I really um, appreciate the the distinction between pure and impure operators at the very beginning of this. I think I, before I read your paper and, and listened to this, I wasn't really thinking of them in, in those terms and how the prehistory of all the operator pattern um, that we take into Kubernetes and um, we co-opt for our own purposes and how important naming things is. And um, so, and, and, and what the confusion could be. So I think what you've done today has really helped me and I, hopefully everybody else who's listening um, to, to really start thinking about this in another way and maybe a little bit clearer um, thinking about it, especially in terms of the telco stuff. There's a couple of questions coming in from YouTube um, in the chat. If you've seen them, Rico Suave, I think that is a pseudonym. Um, but maybe not. Uh, should telco loads be deployed in its own specific cluster or in a generic cluster as long as the CPUs and RAM are available? And then they... Yeah, sure, that's, that's a very good question. And, and uh, you know, I raced through it. And as I said, I, I really oversimplified the, the history. Um, generic, we would love to have a write once, run everywhere universe where you can uh, write the code, write the software, and not think about uh, the hardware in which it runs. Um, and we're constantly moving more and more towards that, and, but it's not true always. And it's not true for, it really depends on the workload too. We have workloads that are maybe closer to uh, the, the physical world, right? Things that require specialized networking equipment. Think of something like an antenna, right? That, that's not generic. Uh, but we have, you know, we have specialized network cards. Um, we have workloads optimized even for one CPU architecture versus the other. Think about x86 versus ARM, for example. Um, so, so it's not true that you could just deploy something to a cloud and expect it to, to magically work in many cases. So we're constantly thinking, um, it's not a simple problem to solve, and uh, part of it is efforts being baked into existing Kubernetes solutions. So Red Hat's OpenShift does a lot of work in terms of managing the infrastructure of itself. So you can have different kinds of nodes. You can have a, a multi-architectural cluster, for example. And then your workloads would be able to be annotated to say, well, I need, I need an ARM environment and I need this amount of memory and I need this access to this kind of accelerator. So, so the dependencies are sometimes uh, rather specific. Um, but still, the advantage of using cloud technologies is not just in, um, that we can write once, run everywhere. Even if it's very specific cluster, uh, hardware, uh, 
using Kubernetes allows us to orchestrate at scale. That That's the big uh, um, sea change that I think Kubernetes brings to the table. We have orchestrators everywhere right now. It's different from OpenStack in which you're just providing virtual machines, but then something would need to install software on those virtual machines. Actually, Kubernetes, Kubernetes manages our software. Um, so, so yeah. I, I really like the phrase you used about Kubernetes being an, I think it was extensible orchestrator. Right. That, that <laughs> I think was a key thing yeah. there. Uh, he has a follow-up question about what makes a cluster telco grade? He's heard about CPU pinning feature, et cetera, but what is it that makes it specialized? Um, I mean, it might be. So, so tel telco grade is a term used uh, um, to talk about software and hardware that would be uh, would match the requirements. Now, the requirements are not just, hey, we want it to run fast. There are regulations and standards. Uh, there are timings that have to have to work in order for the whole chain to work. So. Um, it's not the only only industry with standards, of course, right? Lots of industries have reliability standards and regulations from medical to financial and security standards, et cetera. So, so I would say what, telco grade is just another variation of those kinds of standards. In the end, it's not too special in itself, right? So if you have certain, um, if you have certain timings that you need to work within, well, other industries do as well, and it's not a problem that's unique for telco. So I would say that, and CPU pinning, definitely not unique to, to telco. Um, so the question isn't so much as telco grade, you know, certifying a platform for uh, saying this, you know, this Kubernetes implementation on this hardware is telco grade, but rather uh, asking the question over what workloads are you going to run on it and do they have what they need to, to run well? Um, and those... And the good thing about that story is that it becomes not a telco story, but a general cloud story. You know, if we solve it for one industry, it will be solved for others as well. And that's an advantage that telecommunication companies understand too, moving to off the shelf stuff. Uh, being a snowflake is not a good position to be in. Uh, being in a multi-vendor cloud situation gives you much more power to choose different vendors, to switch between them, to negotiate, and to use industry knowledge that has been developing for years and apply it to telecommunication. Yeah. I think it's also interesting, like I started the whole conversation out about how this past couple of weeks, it seems that Kubernetes operators and telco have been in every conversation that I've had um, with people inside of Red Hat and outside of Red Hat. It's really been, um, telco has, it has a history also of being sort of a hotbed of use cases that get then implemented outside in the rest of the world. And we've been talking about edge computing and um, there's another initiative inside of Red Hat around AI ops in um, telco coming from America Moville did a great talk on um, Roel Reyes is working on something called the Enterprise Neuro Initiative System or something Enterprise Neuro System and using AI ops to, and that, um, to make those autonomous decisions on the edge and about operations and about operating at telco scale. But those things, um, th those are the kinds of ideas, um, and I say ideas because I'm from New England, so I can't say it the other way, um, that, that help all of the other industries and all of the other spaces, which is why it's, I, I think recently, I, we've just been seeing a lot of the things that telcos have had to do, especially around edge computing and keeping the code close to the data and working, you know, making those work decisions um, autonomous and local. And I, this is really, I think, what is at, is at the crux of leveraging op Kubernetes operators in telco is really just another I, set of ideas and patterns that are, we're going to see applied in a lot of places and, and move through um, lots of other industries. So it, it's really been... Uh, yeah, the think telcos, telcos, you don't think of them as really personally as bleeding edge um, thinkers, but um, recently a lot of the work that we're doing here at Red Hat has been um, been taking telcos um, use cases and applying them elsewhere. So I, I'm thinking 
in your Office of CTO work and that Telco Solutions work, we're going to keep watching you and watching what you guys do and bringing you back um, to get some of these big thoughts and big thinking ideas and see how we can apply them in other places. So. No, without a doubt. I'll, I'll add to that that um, Telco use cases, you know, Telco grade use cases, are, uh, are they do push the envelope. Um, there are... We, we can definitely say that uh, in terms of just networking, and by networking here I mean just low-level networking support, TCP IP, for example, you can obviously imagine that telco workloads, CNFs, would require much more sophistication than, uh, uh, than, other, than say, a database, an enterprise application. So I think uh, approaching the telco use cases and trying to solve them benefits everybody in the cloud space. Uh, one of the complaints about Kubernetes is that it doesn't, it's pretty weak with networking. It doesn't have a lot of opinion about networking. You know, you bring your own networking to Kubernetes. You have some sort of uh, SDN, software-defined networking solution that you plug in, uh, but, net, but Kubernetes itself doesn't care too much about that. Well, that's nice until you uh, really need to do a lot of uh, low-level uh, uh, networking work, and then you're asking, well, can Kubernetes help me with this? And if it can't, then you have to develop all these systems on, your, on yourselves. But you know, across the board, I think uh, the telco industry is pushing Kubernetes to to be better with networking, and we see it happening. We have, for example, SCTP support just recently added uh, in, into um, um, Kubernetes, and we're seeing um, the network plumbing group introducing Multis to add uh, additional interfaces. So, um, yeah, t telco is not behind the times. <laughs> Uh, in, in every way, I think in some ways it's really pushing the envelope forward. And, the, and, and I think that some of the conversations I've been having is with Paul Lancaster, who's, who's sitting out there um, listening in, I'm sure, uh, somewhere, and around uh, the certified container CNS um, and the big push. And so a lot of the vendors that have CNS and are working with Red Hat to get them certified to work on Kubernetes and with OpenShift and, and doing all that stuff, they have this been you know, once those things are there, ah, Paul is right there. Yes, Paul, yeah, if you want to chime in. Um, I think that that area is, um, yeah, Paul's been um, preaching to the well, choir. I mean, the only thing I would add, Diane, is that, you know, a lot of the things that Tal points out, the work that we're doing in the CTO's office, is actually helping our ecosystem um, you know, what we're finding is as these, as the ISVs or the business units that, that create software within the network equipment providers that are targeted, they're, they're in customers or the service providers, the telecommunications service providers. Um, as they migrate their applications, they, they actually take advantage of a lot of the work that we've done from an operator perspective. So there's operators that we actually ship with open, uh, OpenShift to be able to take advantage of things like CPU pinning or uh, SRIOV, these are, you know, and, and so what we find is not only the work that we're doing upstream in, you know, OPNFB or LFN now, um, or the work that, that we're doing in CNCF, but it's actually making it into the ecosystem of customer, uh, you know, ISVs that they're deploying um, at scale in the service provider. So that's that's really what I would add. The, the other thing, um, and this we're probably going to have to, sh we can go a little bit longer, the live stream may end, um, but you can hang out in the blue jeans if you like um, and keep talking about this. Um, one of the, the things that you brought up was about making it easier to build operators. And I know, um, and, and Wednesdays, which is today, is the, our day to talk about operators. So we've had the operator, the Java operator SDK group on last week and the week before. Um, people talking about the operator framework and and that. How, how do you see, I mean, and you didn't mention that in your list on your slide, um, the operator framework stuff. I'm just, have you worked with um, those crew and have, are, you, are they embedded into your conversations around these, the Kubernetes operators for um, Telco? Um, of course they are, right? Uh, especially for, um, targeting OpenShift because uh, the operator hub and the operator lifecycle manager are, are so embedded in OpenShift that it makes it a, a, 
you know, a very natural place to start. And uh, Red Hat, of course, as a, a big uh, proponent of operators, uh, can give you a big head start. Uh, but, you know, in, in the, the spaces that we think about, you know, I work a lot with standards bodies like Etsy uh, and ORAN and Oasis. And, uh, and at the end of the day, Kubernetes is an upstream project itself too. So uh, within that space, I think there, there are a lot of different kinds of opinions and needs. Uh, I, can't, I can't expect, for example, every uh, company to have uh, uh, Go developers, right? Or yeah. to be able to invest in the Go programming language. Um, telecommunication companies are kind of interesting. Some of them do a lot of development in-house. Uh, some of them specifically outsource development elsewhere. Um, there's, there's, a lot, uh, uh, there's a variety, and because of that variety, I think it's important to also provide a variety of, of solutions and approaches to doing that. So as I said, you could use Ansible operators. That's, that's a great start, you know, if you're already invested in Ansible and, and designing playbooks. If you're a big Python house, there are solutions for that too. Uh, the main thing I wanted to emphasize is that Kubernetes is itself, you know, the API server in Kubernetes is language agnostic. Yeah. And uh, that's a huge advantage in terms of, of plugging into it. So uh, it works well with also, you know, the, the microservices uh, approach to development, Agile, where you have teams maybe working on, on a very specific unit, a functional unit, a network function or an operator, and um, they might be using different technologies from other teams, right, for various reasons. Um, maybe one is written in C++ and working directly with drivers. The other is written in Ruby because it's talking to some middleware database system. But all of these can work together within the ecosystem of network functions and, and op Kubernetes operators. So, um, so it's the kind of work that I do, which is very a lot of evangelism, and promoting, I, I, uh, I emphasize uh, the truth, which is there, there's a diversity of uh, ways to approach, uh, approach that. No, and I think that's great. Uh, I think that it's one of the things about having the office of the CTO and having people be in that, to do, be in that arena and be give, being given the time and space to do the big thinking and the um, promotion of these new ideas and, and to help us bubble them up um, and get them out there into the universe. And, and, and Tal, that is one of the things I love about your talks, is they make us think. Um, and we all have opinions, um, and we're all opinionated, but I think sometimes having that, um, the overview of the landscape, you, like you did a previous talk on um, introducing Tosca and an AMA on that, and I, I throw the link on that too. One of, what, and th these are the kinds of talks that I think start discussions and start conversations and hopefully drive some standardization and some really useful um, in innovations um, into the into the space. So I am grateful for you for um, uh, taking the time to, first of all, write that wonderful paper, which I will send out um, over the, the internet um, and, and send you, you know, post with it, the YouTube video up on our YouTube channel and um, on the OpenShift Commons. And we are definitely gonna have you back and every time it's surprising to me. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever it is you're working on next, and um, I hope you'll come back. So thank you very much for today. Thank you very much. I, I have a few, uh, a few things on the uh, oven. <laughs> so, uh, so <laughs> As we'll always. Discuss. Yes, so there, we'll definitely give you the podium and, and do this again. So everyone who's out there um, listening in, um, on the Internet, and um, we'll, we'll put all the links up and the slides um, shortly. Um, and I think the raw video will be up on YouTube almost immediately because we're doing live streaming to YouTube. So um, Rico Suave, thank you for your questions and everybody else, Paul, thanks for being here. Um, we'll have you back again soon. Take care, everyone.